the doctrine of repentance today the nature <coughs> the nature of true repentance part 1a this chapter counts uh, 22 pages this is far too long so I'm splitting it up into a part 1a and a part 1b and the same with chapter 4 I will do part 1a and part 1b I shall next show what gospel repentance is repentance is a grace of God's spirit whereby a sinner is inwardly humbled and visibly reformed for a further amplification know that repentance is a spiritual medicine made up of six special ingredients sight of sin is the first the second sorrow for sin the third confession of sin the fourth is shame for sin the fifth is hatred for sin and the sixth is turning away from sin if anyone is left out it loses its virtue we go to the first ingredient and the first and second in ingredients are very long in text so that is why I have to split this chapter ingredient one side of sin the first part of Christ physic is I solve Acts 26 verse 18 it is the great thing noted in the prodigal repentance he came to himself Luke 15 verse 17 you can read that scripture he saw himself a sinner and nothing but a sinner before a man can come to Christ he must first come to himself Solomon in his description of repentance considers uh, this as the first ingredient if they shall bethink themselves 1st Kings 8 47 a man must first recognize and consider what his sin is and know the plague of his heart before he can be dully humbled for it the first creature God made was light so the first thing in a penitent is illumination now ye are light in the Lord Ephesians 5 verse 8 the eye is made both for seeing and weeping sin must first be seen before it can be wept for hence I infer that where there is no sight of sin there can be no repentance many who can spy faults in others see none in themselves they cry that they have good hearts is it not strange that two should live together and eat and drink together yet not know each other such is the case of a sinner his body and soul live together work together eat together yet he is unacquainted with himself he knows not his own heart nor what a hell he carries about him under a veil a deformed face is hid persons are veiled over with ignorance and self-love therefore they see not what deformed souls they have the devil does with them as the falconer with the hawk he blinds them and carries them hooded to hell the sword shall be upon his right eye Zechariah 11 verse 17 men have insight enough into worldly matters but the eye of their mind is smitten they do not see any evil in sin 
the sword is upon their right eye. Ingredient 2. Sorrow for sin. And um, this is built up in several sub sectors. So then you know. Ingredient 2. Sorrow for sin. I will be sorrow for my sin. Psalm 38 verse 18. Ambrose calls sorrow the embittering of the soul. The Hebrew word to be sorrowful signifies to have the soul as it were crucified. This must be in true repentance. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn. Zechariah 12 verse 10 as if they did feel the nails of the cross sticking in their sides. A woman may as well expect to have a child without pangs as one can have repentance without sorrow. He that can believe without doubting suspect his faith and he that can repent without sorrowing suspect his repentance. Martyrs shed blood for Christ and penitents shed tears for sin. She stood at Jesus' feet weeping. Luke 7 verse 38. See how this limbag dropped. The sorrow of her heart ran out at her eye, the brazen laver for the priests to wash in. Exodus 30, verse 18, typified a double laver, the laver of Christ's blood we must wash in by faith, and the laver of tears we must wash in by repentance a true penitent labors to work his heart into a sorrowing frame he blesses the living god when he can weep he is glad of a rainy day for he knows that it is a repentance he will have no cause to repent of though the bread of sorrow be bitter to the taste yet it strengthens the heart psalms 104 verse 13 and second corinthians 7 verse 10 this sorrow for sin is not superficial it is a holy agony it is called in scripture a breaking of the heart the sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite heart. Psalm 51 verse 17 And a rending of the heart. Rend your heart. Joel 2, Joel 2 verse 13 The expressions of smiting on the thigh. Jeremiah 31 verse 19 Beating on the breast. Luke 18 verse 13 Putting on of sackcloth Isaiah 22 verse 12 Plucking of the hair Ezra 9 verse 3 All these are but outward signs of inward sorrow. And the, now we go to several points that goes into what inward sorrow is. This inward sorrow is 1. To make Christ precious Oh how desirable is a Savior to a troubled soul Now Christ is Christ indeed and mercy is mercy indeed Until the heart is full of compunction it is not fit for Christ A welcome is a surgeon to a man who is bleeding from his wounds. The second of inward sorrow is to drive out sin. Sin breeds sorrow 
and sorrow kills sin. Holy sorrow is the rhubarb to purge out the ill humors of the soul. It is said that the tears of fine branches are good to cure the leprosy. Certainly the tears that drop from the penitent are good to cure the leprosy of sin. The salt water of tears kills the worm of conscience. And then the third point that is all about inward sorrow is to make way for solid comfort. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Psalm 126 verse 3. The penitent has a wet seed time but a delicious harvest. Repentance breaks the abscess of sin and then the soul is at ease. Hannah, after weeping, went away and was no more sad. No more. 1 Samuel 1 verse 18 God's troubling of the soul for sin is like the angels' troubling of the pool. John 5 verse 4 Which made way for healing. But not all sorrow evidences true repentance. There is as much difference between true and false sorrow as between water in the spring which is sweet and water in the sea which is briny the apostle speaks of sorrowing after a godly manner second corinthians 7 verse 9 but what is this godly sorrowing there are six qualifications of it. So now we go to six qualificational points all about godly sorrowing. Point one. True godly sorrow is inward. It is inward in two ways. A. It is a sorrow of the heart. The sorrow of hypocrites lies in their faces. They disfigure their faces. Matthew 6 verse 16. They make a sour face but their sorrow goes no further. Like the dew that wets the leaf but does not soak the, the root. Ahab's repentance was in outward show. His garments were rent but not his spirit. 1 Kings 21 verse 27. Godly sorrow goes deep like a vein which bleeds inwardly. The heart bleeds for sin. They were pricked in their heart. Acts 2 verse 37 As the heart bears a chief part in sinning, so it must in sorrowing. And then the second of this first point is it is a sorrow for heart sins the first outbreaks and risings of sin Paul grieved for the law in his members Romans 7 verse 23 the true mourner weeps for the stirring of pride and concupiscence He grieves for the root of bitterness, even though it never blossoms into act. A wicked man may be troubled for scandalous sins. A real comfort laments heart sins. And now we go to the second point of the six points all about godly sorrow. The second godly sorrow is ingenuous. It is sorrow for the offense rather than for the punishment. God's law has been infringed, his love abused, and this melts the soul in tears. A man may be sorry, yet not repent, as a thief is sorry when he is taken. 
not because he stole, but because he has to pay the penalty. Hypocrites grieve only for the bitter consequences of sin. I have read of a fountain that only sends forth streams on the evening before a famine. Likewise, their eyes never pour out tears except when God's judgments are approaching. Pharaoh was more troubled for the frogs and river of blood than for his sin. Godly sorrow, however, is chiefly for the trespass against God, so that even if there were no conscience to smite, no devil to accuse, no hell to punish, yet the soul would still be grieved because of the prejudice done to the living God. My sin is ever before me. Psalm 51 verse 3 David does not say the sword threatened is ever before me but my sin oh that I should offend so good a living God that I should grieve my comforter this breaks my heart godly sorrow shows itself to be ingenuous because when a Christian knows that he is out of the gunshot of hell and shall never be damned yet still he grieves for sinning against that free grace which has pardoned him godly sorrow is fiducial It is intermixed with faith. The father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Mark 9 verse 24 Here was sorrow for sin checkered with faith. As we have seen, a bright rainbow appear in a watery cloud. Spiritual sorrow will sink the heart if the pulley of faith does not raise it. As our sin is ever before us, so God's promise must be ever before us. As we much feel our sting, so we must look up to Christ our brazen serpent. Some have faces so swollen with worldly grief that they can hardly look out of their eyes, that weeping is not good, which blinds the eye of faith. If there are not some dawnings of faith in the soul, it is not the sorrow of humiliation, but of despair. And then we go to point four. God of godly sorrow godly sorrow is a great sorrow in that day shall there be a great morning as the morning of Hadadri Momon Zechariah 12 verse 11 two sons did set that day when Josiah died and there was a great funeral morning to such a hide must sorrow for sin be boiled up. Pecto of can I hear? Yeah. Sigh sighings from the bottom of one's heart. Then we get a question. One do all have the same degree of sorrow? Answer no. Sorrow does produce greater or lesser sorrows. In the new birth all have pangs, but some have sharper pangs than others. Some are naturally of a more rugged disposition of higher spirits, and are not easily brought to stoop. These must have greater humiliation as a knotty piece of timber must have greater wedges driven into it, and some have been more heinous or heinous 
offenders and their sorrow must be suitable to their sin. Some patients have their sores let out with a needle, others with a lens. Mm. Flagitious sinners must be more bruised with the hammer of the law. Some are designed and cut out for higher service to be eminently instrumental for the living God, and these must have a mightier work of humiliation pass upon them, those whom God intends to be pillars in his church must be more hewn. So Paul, the apostle who was to be God's ensign bear bearer, to carry his name before the Gentiles and kings was to have his heart more deeply lanced by repentance. Question 2. But how great must sorrow for sin be in all? Answer. It must be as great as for any worldly loss. Eyes are swollen with weeping. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn as for an only son. Zechariah 12 verse 10. Sorrow for sin must surpass worldly sorrow. We must grieve more for offending the living God than for the loss of dear relations. In that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Isaiah 22 verse 12. This was for sin, but in the case of the burial of the dead we find the living God prohibiting tears and boldness. Jeremiah 22 verse 10 and chapter 16 verse 6. To intimate that sorrow for sin must exceed sorrow at the grave and with good reason for in the burial of the dead it is only a friend who departs but in sin God departs sorrow for sin should be so great as to swallow up all other sorrows as when the pain of the stone and good meat. The pain of the stone swallows up the pain of the good. We are to find as much bitterness in weeping for sin as ever we found sweetness in committing it. Surely David found more bitterness in repentance than ever he found comfort in Bathsheba. Our Sorrow for sin must be such as makes us willing to let go of those sins which brought in the greatest income of profit or delight. The physic shows itself strong enough when it has purged out our disease. The Christian has arrived at a sufficient measure of sorrow when the love of sin is purged out. And then we go to the fifth point of godly sorrow. Godly sorrow in some cases is joined with restitution. Whoever has wronged others in their estate by unjust, fraudulent dealing ought in conscience to make them recompense. There is an express law for this. He shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof, and add unto it the fifth part thereof, and give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. Book of Numbers, chapter 5, verse 7. Thus Zacchaeus made restitution. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Luke 19 verse 8. When Silimus, the great Turk, lay upon his deathbed, 
being urged by peers to put to charitable use that wealth he had wronged the Persian merchants of. He commanded rather that it should be sent back to the right owners. Shall not a Christian's creed be better than a Turk's Koran? It is a bad sign when a man on his deathbed bequeaths his soul to the living God and his ill-gotten goods to his friends. I can hardly think the living God will receive his soul. Augustine said, without restitution, no remission. And it was a speech of old Latimer. If ye restore not goods unjustly gotten, ye shall cough in hell. Question. Suppose a person has wronged another in his estate and the wronged man is dead. What should he do? Well, answer. Let him restore his ill-gotten goods to that man's heirs and successors. If none of them be living, let him restore to the living God, that is, let him put his unjust gain into God's treasury by relieving the poor. Second question. What if the party who did the wrong is dead? Answer then they who are his heirs ought to make restitution. What I say is, if there be any who have estates left them, <clears throat> and they know that the parties who left their estates had defrauded others and died with that guilt upon them, and then the heirs or executors who possess those estates are bound in conscience to make restitution, otherwise they entail the curse of God upon their family. And then the third question, if a man has wronged another and it is not able to restore, what should he do? Answer, let him deeply humble himself before the living God, promising to the wronged party full satisfaction if the Lord make him able and God will accept the will for the deed. And now we go to the last point of this list of six godly sorrows and the last one is number six. Godly sorrow is abiding. It is not a few tears shed in a passion that will serve the turn. Some will fall a weeping at a sermon, but it is like an April shower, soon over, or like a vein opened and presently stopped again. True sorrow must be habitual. O Christian, the disease of your soul is chronic and frequently returns upon you. Therefore you must be continually physicking yourself by repentance. This is that sorrow which is after a godly manner. Use, how far are they from repentance who never had any of this godly sorrow? Such are the papists who leave out the very soul of repentance, making all penitential work consist in fasting, penance, and pilgrimage, pilgrimages in which there is nothing of spiritual sorrow. They torture their bodies, but their hearts are not rent. What is this but the carcass of repentance? And then carnal Protestants who are strangers to godly sorrow. They cannot endure a serious thought, nor do they love to trouble their heads about sin. Paracelsus spoke of a frenzy some have which will make them die dancing. 
Likewise, sinners spend their days in mirth. They fling away sorrow and go dancing to damnation. Some have lived many years, yet never put a drop in God's bottle, nor do they know what a broken heart means. They weep and wring their hands as if they were undone when their estates are gone, but have not agony of soul for sin. There is a twofold sorrow, firstly a rational sorrow, which is an act of the soul whereby it has a displacency against sin and chooses any torture rather than to admit sin. Secondly, there is a sensitive sorrow, which is expressed by many tears. The first of these is to be found in every child of God. But the second, which is a sorrow running out at the eye, all have not. Yet it is a very commendable to see a weeping penitent. Christ counts as great beauties those who are tender-eyed and well may sin make us weep. We usually weep for the loss of some great good by sin. We have lost the favor of God. If Micah did so weep for the loss of a false god, saying, Ye have taken away my gods, and what have I more? Judge 18, verse 24. Then, well, may we weep for our sins, which have taken away the true living God from us. Some may ask the question whether our repentance and sorrow must always be alike. Although repentance must be always kept alive in the soul, yet there are two special times when we must renew our repentance in an, in an extraordinary manner. Uh, A. Before the receiving of the Lord's Supper. This spiritual Passover is to be eaten with bitter herbs. Now our eyes should be fresh broached with tears and the stream of sorrow overflow. A repenting frame is a sacramental frame. A broken heart and a broken Christ do well agree. The more bitterness we taste in sin, the more sweetness we shall taste in Christ. When Jacob wept, he found God, and he called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. Genesis 32, verse 30. The way to find Christ comfortably in the sacrament is to go weeping tighter. Christ will say to a humble penitent, as to Thomas, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. John 20, verse 27. And let those bleeding wounds of mine heal thee. Another time, this is B, another time of extraordinary repentance is at the hour of death. This should be a weeping season. Now is our last work to be done for heaven, and our best wine of tears should be kept against such a time. We should repent now that we have sinned so much and wept so little, that God's back has been so full and this bottle so empty. Job 14 verse 17 We should repent now that we repented no sooner, that the garrisons of our hearts held out so long against God. Ere they were leveled by repentance, we should repent now that we have loved Christ no more, that we have fetched no more virtue from Him and brought no more glory to Him. <clears throat> It should be our grief 
on our deathbed that our lives have had so many blanks and blots in them, that our duties have been so fly-blown with sin, that our obedience has been so imperfect and we have gone so lame in the ways of God. <clears throat> When the soul is going out of the body, it should swim to heaven in a sea of tears. And then we go to the last ingredient of this chapter, which is um, ingredient three, confession of sin. Sorrow is such a vehement passion that it will have fent. It fends itself at the eyes by weeping and at the tongue by confession. The children of Israel stood and confessed their sins. Nehemiah 9 verse 2 I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Hosea 5 verse 15 it is a metaphor alluding to a mother who, when she is angry, goes away from the child and hides her face till the child acknowledges its fault and begs pardon. Um, a Gregory uh, Nazianzen calls confession a solve a solve for a wounded soul. Confession is self-accusing. Lo, I have sinned. Second Samuel 24 verse 17. Indeed, among men it is otherwise. No man is bound to accuse himself, but desires to see his accuser. When we come before the living God, however, we must accuse ourselves and the truth is that by this self-accusation we prevent Satan's accusing. In our confessions we tax ourselves with pride, infidelity, passion, so that when Satan, who is called the accuser, of the brethren shall lay these things to our charge. God will say, they have accused themselves already, therefore, Satan, thou art none suited. Thy accusations come too late. The humble sinner does more than accuse himself. He, as it were, sits in judgment and passes sentence upon himself. He confesses that he has deserved to be bound over to the wrath of God. And hear what the Apostle Paul says. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31 but have not wicked men like Judas and Saul confessed sin? Yes, but theirs was not a true confession. That confession of sin may be right and genuine. These eight qualifications are requisite. So we now get the list of eight qualifications that are requisite for a good confession. 1. Confession must be voluntary. It must come as water out of a spring, freely. The confession of the wicked is extorted, like the confession of a man upon a rack when a spark of God's wrath flies into their conscience or they are in fear of death. Then they will fall to their confessions. Second, confession must be with compunction. 
the heart must deeply resent it. A natural man's confessions run through him as water through a pipe. They do not at all affect him. But true confession leaves heart-wounding impressions on a man. David's soul was burdened in the confession of his sins. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Psalm 38, verse 4. It is one thing to confess sin and another thing to feel sin. The third is, confession must be sincere. Our hearts must go along with our confessions. The hypocrite confesses sin but loves it, like a thief who confesses to stole goods, yet loves stealing. How many confess pride and covetousness with their lips, but roll them as honey under their tongue. Augustine said that before his conversion, he confessed sin and begged power against it. But his heart whispered with him, Not yet, Lord. He was afraid to leave his sin too soon. A good Christian is more honest. His heart keeps pace with his tongue. He is convinced of the sins he confesses and abhors the sins he is convinced of. And then, the fourth, in true confession, a man particu particularizes sin. A wicked man acknowledges he is a sinner in general. He confesses sin by wholesale. His confession of sin is much like Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I have dreamed a dream, Daniel 2 verse 3, but he could not tell what it was. The thing is gone from me, Daniel 2, verse 5. In the same way, a wicked man says, Lord, I have sinned, but does not know what the sin is. At least he does not remember. Whereas a true comfort acknowledges his particular sin as it is with a wounded man who comes to the surgeon and shows him all his wounds. Here I was cut in the head, there I was shot in the arm. So a mournful sinner confesses the several distempters of his soul. Israel drew up a particular charge against themselves. We have served a Balim, Judge 10, verse 10. The prophet recites the very sin which brought a curse with it. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets which speak in thy name. Daniel 9 verse 6 By a diligent inspection into our hearts we may find some particular sin indulged. Point to that sin with a tear. Then number 5 A true penitent confesses sin in the fountain. He acknowledges the pollution of his nature. The sin of our nature is not only a uh, privation of good, but an infusion of evil. It is like canker to iron or stain to scarlet. David acknowledges his birth sin. I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51 verse 5. We are ready to charge many of our first sins to Satan's temptations. But this sin of our nature is holy from ourselves. We cannot shift it off to Satan. We have a root within that bears gall and wormwood. Deuteronomy 29 verse 18. Our nature is an abyss and seminary of all evil from whence come those scandals that infest 
the world. It is this depravity of nature which poisons our holy things. It is this which brings on God's judgments and makes our mercies stick in the birth. O oh, confess sin in the fountain. Then we go to uh, the last point, point six, sin is to be confessed with all its circumstances and aggravations. Those sins which are committed under the gospel horizon are doubtless dyed in grain. Confess sins against knowledge, against grace, against vows, against experiences, against judgments. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them. For all this they sinned still, Psalm 78, verse 31 and 32. These are killing aggravations, which do ascend and announce our sins. Oh, there were eight points, oh darn. In confession we must so charge ourselves as to clear God. So should the Lord be severe in his providences and unsheath his bloody sword, yet we must acquit him and acknowledge he has done us no wrong. Nehemiah, in his confessing of sin, vindicates God's righteousness, albeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us. Nehemiah 9.33 Then the last one, point eight, we must confess our sins with a resolution not to act them over and over again. And this last point is very long and um, it has at least uh, three sub sectors I see. So I will see. Some run from the confessing of sin to the committing of sin like the Persians who have one day in the year when they kill serpents and after that day suffer them to swarm again. Likewise, many seem to kill their sins in the confessions and afterwards let them grow as fast as ever. Cease to do evil. Isaiah 1 16 it is vain to confess we have done those things we ought not to have done and continue still in doing so Pharaoh confessed he had sinned Exodus 9 17 but when the thunder ceased he fell to his sin again he sinned yet more and hardened his heart Exodus 9 34 Origen calls confession the vomit of the soul whereby the conscious or conscience is east of that burden which did lie upon it. Thus we see how confession must be qualified and these were the eight points and point number eight is um, done in, in, in three sections I think so um, let us see. All right. Use one, the confession, a necessary ingredient in repentance. Here is a bill of indictment against four sorts of persons. Well, I'm going quite qu quickly through this because I'm already over an hour reading because things went wrong, so I needed to start reading again. One, it reproves those that hide their sins. As Raquel hid her father's images under her. Genesis 31, verse 34. Then we have the second. It reproves those who do indeed confess sin, but only by halves. 
They do not confess all, they confess the pence but not the pounds, they confess vain thoughts or badness of memory but not the sins they are most guilty of, such as rash anger, extortion, uncleanness. Like he in Plutarch, who complained his stomach was not very good when his lungs were bad and his liver rotten. But if we do not confess all, how should we expect that God will pardon all? Point three, it reproves those who in their confessions minds and extenuate their sins. A gracious soul labors to make the worst of his sins, but hypocrites make the best of them. They do not deny they are sinners, but they do what they can to lessen their sins. They indeed offend sometimes, but it is their nature <clears throat> and it is long of such occasion. These are excuses rather than confessions. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, because I feared the people. 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. Saul lays his sin upon the people. They would have him spare the sheep and oxen. So this was nothing more than an ordinary apology not a self-indictment. Point four, it reproves those who are so far from confessing sin that they boldly plead for it. Instead of having tears to lament it, they use arguments to defend it. If their sin be passion, they will justify it. I do well to be angry, John 4, verse 9. If it be covetousness, they will vindicate it. When men commit sin, they are the devil's servants. When they plead for it, they are the devil's attorneys, and he will give them a fee. Well, used to. Let us show ourselves penitence by sincere confession of sin. The thief on the cross made a confession of his sin. We indeed are condemned justly. Luke 23 verse 41 And Christ said to him, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke 23 verse 43 which might have occasioned that speech of Augustine's, that confession of sin shuts the mouth of hell and opens the gate of paradise, that we may make a free and ingenuine, ingenuous confession of sin. Uh, so let us consider holy confession gives glory to God. Confession is a means to humble the soul, so he subscribes himself a hell deserving sinner will have little heart to be proud. Confession gives vent to a troubled heart when guilt lies boiling in the conscience. Confession gives ease. It is like the launching of an abscess which gives ease to the patient and confession confession purges out sin Augustine called it the expeller of vice sin is a bad blood confession is like the opening of a vein to let it all come out confession is like the dung gate through which all the filth of the city was carried forth. Nehemiah 3, verse 13. Confession is like pumping at the, lay, at the leak. It lets out that sin which would otherwise drown. Confession is the sponge that wipes the spots from the soul off. 
confession of sin endears Christ to the soul. If I say I am a sinner, how precious will Christ's blood be to me? Confession of sin makes a way for pardon. No sooner did the prodigal came with a confession in his mouth, I have sinned against heaven, then his father's heart did melt towards him, and he kissed him. Luke 15 verse 20 When David said, I have sinned, the prophet brought him a box with a pardon. The Lord hath put away thy sin. Second Samuel Verse 12 of chapter 12, verse 13. He who sincerely confesses sin has God's bond for a pardon. If we confess our sins, he is a faithful and just to forgive us our sins. First John 1 verse 9. Why does not the apostle say that if we confess, he is merciful to forgive our sins? No, he's just because he has bound himself by promise to forgive such. God's truth and justice are engaged for the pardoning of that man who confesses sin and comes with a penitent heart by faith in Christ. And then how reasonable and easy is this command that we should confess sin. It is a reasonable command for if one has wronged another, what is more rational than to confess he has wronged him? We having wronged God by sin, how equal and consonant to reason is it that we should confess the offense. It is an easy command, what a fast difference is there between the first covenant and the second. In the first covenant it was if you commit sin you die, in the second covenant it is if you confess sin, you shall live further and have mercy. So in the first covenant, no surety was allowed under the covenant of grace. If we do but confess the debt, Christ will be our surety. God says to us, I do not ask for sacrifices of rams to expiate your guilt. I do not bid you part with the fruit of your body for the sin of your soul. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Do but draw up an indictment against yourself and plead guilty and you shall be sure of mercy. All this should render this duty amable. Throw out the poison of sin by confession, and this day is salvation come to thy house. This was said by Jesus to Zacchaeus. we go to the last where a man has confessed his sin to God yet still his conscience is burdened and he can have no ease in his mind it is very requisite that he should confess his sins to some prudent pious friend who may advise him and speak a word in due season <coughs> James 5 verse 16 they say sinful modesty in Christians that they are not more free with their ministers and other spiritual friends in unburdening themselves and opening the source and troubles of their souls to them 
if there is a thorn sticking in the conscience it is good to make use of those who may help to pluck it out and then thirdly uh, where any man has slandered another and by clipping his good name has made it weight lighter he is bound to make confession the scorpion carries its poison in its tail the slanderer in his tongue his words pierce deep like the quills of the porcupine that person who has murdered another in his good name or by bearing false witness has damaged him in his estate ought to confess his sin and ask forgiveness if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift matthew 5 verse 23 and 24 how can this reconciliation be effected but by confessing the injury till this is done god will accept none of your services do not think the holiness of the altar will privilege you your praying and hearing are in vain till you have appeased your brother's anger by confessing your fault to him and with this said i have come to the end of this chapter three part one and the next time we do the other three um the last three of this list of ingredients of repentance so thank you so much for listening to it and um, let all these words of wisdom sink into your heart and if you do not really understand what is being said here then go to the holy spirit and ask for clarification and more in-depth understanding i wish you all a beautiful and a brightful day and uh, give your thanksgiving to the father in all the things you do and eat and drink and as last i say god bless you